Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, the webinar will begin shortly and we'll discuss solar heating and cooling, market and industry trends 2017. We look forward to your participation in this webinar and also in our Q&A session later. Before we begin with our webinar, I would like to introduce the International Solar Energy Society. So the International Solar Energy Society, ISIS, is a non-profit UN accredited membership NGO. The ISIS vision is to achieve 100% renewable energy for all used efficiently and wisely. We represent a diverse membership of academics, researchers, energy practitioners, consultants, students, businesses, and advocates. ISIS works together with like-minded organizations from countries around the world to advance the renewable energy transformation. So please support our work and the global energy transformation by becoming a member. Have a look at our website, iscs.org and join.isis.org. We understand that sometimes the time of the webinar may not suit people in many parts of the world. While we do try to alternate the times, we know it's not always possible. Therefore, we will post a webinar recording on our website. ISIS members, you guys just log into the website with your username and password. If you're not a member, you can still see the recording on our YouTube channel and also on the Solar Academy website and the Solar Academy YouTube channel. You are welcome and encouraged to ask questions at any time throughout the webinar, and we really hope you do. To ask a question, select the questions pane on your screen and type in your question. Today, I, uh, we have um, three expert speakers and one moderator for you uh, for this webinar. Like I said, the webinar is a Solar Academy webinar organized by the IEA SHC's program. And our moderator for today is Pedro Diaz, the Secretary General of Solar Heat Europe from Belgium. He will give a short introduction of today's webinar topic and also moderate the questions and answers session after all of the presentations. So without further ado, I hand over to you, Pedro, and hope you all enjoy today's webinar. Thank you very much, Juana, and uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity to cooperate with, uh, with this webinar as moderator. So, uh, as Juana said, my name is Pedro Diaz. I represent Solar Heat Europe. Uh, many of you might know it uh, um, with its previous name, ESTIF. We are um, a trade association representing solar and cooling uh, in Europe. Um, I'm quite excited about the topic we have today, and we have three outstanding speakers, uh, Werner Weiss, Berber Lab, and Jean-Christophe Adorn. As you know, the webinar is first to take one hour and a half, so the presentations will last about one hour in total, and afterwards we'll have 30 minutes for Q&A session. So you can type your questions anytime in the question box, but please note that this will be addressed only at the end of the presentation, so in the period dedicated to the Q&A. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker um, that will start with an introduction about the IEA Solid and Cooling Solar Academy and uh, the activities of the IEA Solid and Cooling Program, and then uh, proceed for his presentation about the new edition of the solar heat worldwide. The speaker is Werner Weiss. Uh, Werner is one of the most uh, reputed experts in our sector and, and very well known. Um, for me, it has been a pleasure to work with Werner over the years, in particular in the Re European technology for uh, and innovation platform on renewability and cooling. Werner is the board member of this platform and a very active contributor since 2009. But he is also founding member and director of the Austrian Research Institute, a Intech in, in Gleisdorf, um, and he's working in national international solar thermal and energy efficiency projects since the beginning of the 1980s. So Werner is also the co-author of the study Solar Heat Worldwide uh, that we'll present to us uh, today. So Werner, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Pedro. Uh, good day to everybody. Uh, as announced already by Pedro, before I start my actual presentation on Solar Heat Worldwide, I want to briefly introduce the Solar Academy. The Solar Academy for Heating and Cooling in Buildings and Industry is uh, organized by the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Program. And 
very briefly to the solar heating and cooling program. We are uh, a part of a research cooperation of the IEA. It's currently 20 member countries plus the European Union. Uh, and via our sponsors, which are ISIS, ECRI, so it's the Western, uh, West African Energy and Efficiency uh, Institute, and also for North Africa, we are also representing with these three sponsors another 47 uh, additional countries. So we work together in different research projects, and the idea was two years ago to establish the Solar Academy in order to share what we have learned in our research tasks. Um, and just briefly how you can participate. One possibility is the webinars. We, help, we hold quarterly, like the one today. Uh, we have videos, which you can download from our website of the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Program. For instance, we have 12, up to now, we have 12 uh, interviews with presenters of the SHC 2017 conference, but also we have 11 presentations of a conference we had in Qatar in 2016. But this is, will continuously grow. On the other hand, we organize national days, like one we do next week in Sweden, where we cooperate with national research experts and exchange information and results uh, from the international work and the national work. And we also organize on-site training. This means we uh, provide experts knowledge uh, on request to IEA SHC members, uh, like we had last one, uh, the last one we had last year in South Africa on solar heat for industrial processes. And something like this we do also this year in China on this dist solar district heating. Uh, so this is something what is coming up on demand, on request of SHC members. Uh, and if you want to know more, just visit our website. So with this, I want to come to my actual presentation on solar heat worldwide on the edition 2018. Uh, we prepared this report every year for 12 or 13 years now for the IEA solar heating and cooling program. Uh, in the 2018 edition, we show the global market development and trends in 2017. And if you're interested in detailed market figures, then you can find it for 2016 for 66 countries worldwide. You, of course, can download the overall report. You can see on the bottom uh, the link where you can download it from the IEA SHC website. As I mentioned already, we have 66 countries covered all over the world, representing about 4.8 billion people, or about 66% of the world population. And the installed capacity is estimated to represent about 95% of the solar thermal world market. So all the countries you see here in color, we have, we have detailed uh, data from the countries and the countries in gray we estimate the installed capacity. My first part is on global thermal market development and the status in 2017. As you can see here on this chart, the global solar thermal capacity of uh, unglazed and glazed water collectors in operation grew from 62 gigawatt or 89 million square meters in 2000. So it's on the left-hand side of this chart. And it grew to more than 470 gigawatt uh, in 2017. Uh, this uh, solar thermal capacity produces more, represents uh, solar energy yields of 388 terawatt hours uh, in 2017. So it's quite significant growth. This grew from the capacity grew from 2000 uh, to 2017 by the factor of 7.6. If we compare the installed capacity and uh, energy supply of the different, I would call it new renewable energy 
uh, technologies, so not uh, including the big ones like biomass and hydropower. Then you can see here on this chart the red bars show you the installed capacity. Ah, sorry, blue one, the installed capacity, and the red one, the energy supplied, so the energy yield. And as you can see here, uh, wind power is first with 539 uh, gigawatt installed capacity, followed by solar thermal with 472, and on third place it is 402 gigawatt installed capacity, it's photovoltaic. And then you have geothermal power with 13, solar thermal power 5, and ocean and tidal power with approximately 1 gigawatt installed capacity. The red bars show you the energy supplied. And of course, here you see the, the difference ratio between total capacity and energy supplied. This basically shows you the full load hours uh, these systems are running. So number one here in terms of uh, energy supplied is wind with 1,430 terawatt hours, followed by PV with nearly 500 terawatt hours and 388 terawatt hours solar thermal. Uh, of course, we compare here heat and power, but usually the heat sector is underestimated because there's more publicity made around the electric uh, technologies. The contribution of the systems were installed by the end of 2017. Uh, so we had uh, the solar thermal yields, as I mentioned before, amounted 388 terawatt hours. This represents avoided CO2 of 134.7 million tons every year of CO2. On the other hand, the oil equivalent we saved is nearly 42 million tons of oil just saved by the use of solar thermal systems. Jobs and turnover, I think it's also quite important. What is the impact on jobs? Uh, so it's in the, in the range of 700,000 jobs worldwide, the people working on solar thermal production, installation, and of course, also on, on research. There's a quite significant uh, turnover of the solar thermal industry, which is estimated to be 16 billion euro or 19.2 billion US dollar. If you look to the market developments and trends in 2017, uh, in general, compared to the year 2016, the new installations uh, declined by 4.2%. Uh, the most dramatic development was in China, where for the fourth year in a row, the market declined. So we had twice in 2014 and 15, a decline of minus 17%. And then nine, minus 9% in 2016 and 2017, so it gets less, it's uh, a decline of, of 6%. So this is the major factor why we had a decline on the worldwide scale in total is 4.2%. Uh, an interesting fact uh, in China is, which is in my point of view remarkable, that in 2017, there was an increase of newly installed flat blade collectors and vacuum tubes uh, declined, so the cap capacity declined. Uh, as most of you know, uh, the Chinese market is dominated by evacuated tube collectors, so there might be a change in the, in the trend uh, that more and more flat blade collectors are installed also in China. A very positive market growth we are recorded in India with a plus of 26%, but also Mexico uh, is a plus of 7% and in Turkey is about 4%. And of course, a lot of other countries, smaller countries, uh, recorded smaller uh, market growth. Um, what is also remarkable, the megawatt scale solar supported district heating systems and solar heat for and cooling applications for commercial and industrial sector, they have really gained increasing interest all over the world. In general, we can uh, detect that solar thermal heating systems in the building sector, they have really a challenging time. So for single and single family houses, which represent about 90% of the world market, uh, they are really under pressure from heat pumps and photovoltaic systems. 
And this is the main reason why we had this 4.2% decline in the market, because this uh, sector of small scale systems are coming under pressure from the other renewable uh, technologies. If you look on large scale systems for the supply of residential, commercial and public buildings, and when I tell you large scale, it means it's uh, bigger than 350 uh, kilowatt or 500 square meter systems, then you see in nearly exponential growth over the last years. Uh, by the end of 2016, we have recorded 296 large scale systems. They were in operation and the to total installed collector area of these systems equaled 1.7 million square meters. And without taking into account the concentrating systems, it represented about 1.1 gigawatt thermal uh, installed capacity. Where are these systems? So by far leading uh, is Denmark. In Denmark, on the left-hand side of this chart, you see the uh, installed uh, systems and collector area in Denmark. In Denmark, we have 111 systems. Out of this 296 large-scale systems we have recorded, so it's really the leading country. The collector area installed in Denmark of 1.3 million square meters or a capacity of 912 megawatt. Um, number two is Germany and Austria. Number three with 28 systems installed uh, and followed by China, Saudi Arabia, Sweden, Poland, and so forth. So these are the leading countries here and the green uh, columns show you the collector area uh, installed and then you can clearly see that uh, Denmark is clearly leading this market and is here really the trendsetter. This just shows you a, a picture of how these systems look like. That's uh, one picture from Disticating Invoyance in Denmark. There's a load balancing bit storage in the back, uh, which was not filled at this time. So you see the big bit storage will be filled with water, covered with insulation, and heat is stored from summer to winter time where it's used for district heating. Another example is the multiple family building in Kreilsheim in Germany. It's a one, uh, sorry, 5.1 megawatt in, in, uh, installation installed on multiple family houses. Uh, something what is new in our solar heat worldwide report, the first time we also collected data of uh, concentrating solar collectors, especially now they are coming up and used for district heating. This is one example of the system in Bödersleff in Denmark. This has an installed capacity of 16.6 megawatt. And it not only supply, supplies the district heating network, but also to power production as an add-on to the biomass fueled ORC system. So here we have, that's really the trend where it's going in already now, and we see significant more uh, potential here in sector coupling. So using the systems, medium temperature, you produce medium temperature heat, with these parapolic trough collectors, even in Denmark, Use it for this, in this case, for the ORC uh, process for electricity, but also for district heating. So this sector coupling might come up more and more in the next years. Another hot topic is solar heat for industrial process heat. Bearable app will give you some more detailed information in the next presentation. I'll give just a very brief overview on uh, the global process heat plants in operation. Uh, by beginning of, of this year, uh, we had uh, 624 of these so-called ship systems with about 600,000 square meter collector area in operation. Uh, and you can see here uh, the bigger system, we have only two systems with bigger than 30,000 square meters, 26 systems in the range between 1,000 and, and 30,000 square meters. And the majority of the systems is, you can see it here, is 45 systems between 500 and 1,000 square meters. Then it's 
128 systems between 100 and 500 square meters. So at the moment, the smaller systems, smaller uh, systems are the majority, but more and more really large scale systems are coming up. Uh, concerning collectors used in industry, in terms of number of systems, it's still the flat plate collector is used in 124 systems. Uh, parabolic trough collectors is used in 49 systems, but as you can see here, uh, it has the biggest installed capacity with 111 uh, megawatt installed capacity, where I have to mention that just 100 of this 111 uh, megawatt is installed in just one system, so I will show you briefly. And then we have evacuated tube collectors, 46 systems, and so forth. The others are and uh, just two systems are documented at the moment is Fresnel collectors. Most of the systems are installed in the food and beverage industry, so that's the main application at the moment, but also several systems in the textile chemical industry. And as you can see here on the right hand side, in the mining sector, there are just 14 systems, but it's the biggest one, the installed capacity of 131 megawatt installed capacity. So it's going more and more in, in the direction of large scale systems, this clear trend uh, we see in the last years. Uh, concerning countries, the leading countries in terms of number of systems are Mexico, India and Austria. Uh, Mexico 65, uh, India 46 systems and then 26 in Austria, Germany 23, in the US there are 18 systems and so forth. And again, you can see here, China has less systems, but quite big systems installed. You see it on the, on the green uh, column here. And the same is in Chile with the copper mining industry. Just a few systems, two, but very big capacity installed. Uh, the highlight last year was the solar plant for enhanced oil recovery in Oman is installed capacity of 100 megawatt installed capacity. And this uh, is just uh, the starting point. It's just a, a, very, a small part of the overall system with each under construction. It's 800 megawatt installed. And here you see the parabolic trough are installed in glass houses. So with this, uh, they produce 660 tons of steam per day for the Amal oil field. And the main advantage is they could reduce, glass point could reduce significantly the cost uh, for the construction of the parabolic trough because they have no wind loads. And in desert conditions, you can imagine if you have these parabolic troughs in sandstorms, it's not to the benefit of, of, the, of the parabolic troughs and it's easier to clean the glass houses. And this uh, heat, or the steam uh, is used uh, in the Amal oil field located in uh, the south of Oman uh, to extract this uh, heavy oil as an alternative to steam generated from natural gas. Finally, I want to show you the total installed capacity in operation in 2016. So for 2016, we have very detailed data for all 66 countries. So if you're interested in this, you can look for your country in the overall report. But just give you a, a brief overview. Uh, China is leading with 71% of the total installed capacity worldwide. Europe accounts for 11%. And the rest of the world, I would say it's 17.7%. The biggest share here is 4.1% in the US and Canada, followed by Latin America, Asia without China, so it's mainly India. Then the MENA region, Australia, New Zealand, Sub Saharan Africa accounts for 0.3%, and then you have something like 5% all other countries. Uh, top 10 countries of the accumulated water collectors in installation. Uh, the first slide here on the top shows you the top 10 countries. As mentioned already, China has installed 324,000 megawatt of solar thermal, followed by US, Turkey, Germany, Brazil, India, Australia, Austria, Israel, and Greece. So these are the top 10. And the different colors 
indicate the different collector types used. So blue is unglazed water collector. For instance, in the US, it's mainly the market of swimming pool absorbers, unglazed collectors. Just a small part is flat plate collectors. In Turkey, you see that uh, the orange part is flat plate. On top is evacuated tube collectors. Just an explanation. So China is by far the, the biggest market with more than 70% of the total market. If you look at the top 10 from another perspective, per thousand capita, it gives you a completely different uh, picture. If you look at, at it on the uh, capita perspective, then it shows you something on the market penetration. And this gives, as I said, a different picture. China, who is in absolute terms number one, is number eight worldwide in terms of installed capacity per inhabitant. But nevertheless, China is making up every year uh, one point going to the left-hand side. And I guess within five, six years, they will be number two or three. Uh, and on the other hand, Austria, number eight, in terms of absolute installed capacity is number two in terms of installed capacity. So I hope I could give you a brief overview on the content of solar heat worldwide. If you're interested in the overall report, just download it from the website, which is indicated here. Um, and I thank you for your attention and I'm available for questions in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Werner. Uh, we proceed for the, um, the next presentation. I'll just make a quick remark. So you can uh, place your questions anytime in the question box. Uh, they will be addressed later in the, after the presentations. Uh, please note that these are for questions for speakers. So this is not a chat. Uh, so you should only use it for concrete questions for the, the speakers um, today. So our next speaker is Berbel Elp. Um, it's an extremely well-known journalist uh, covering for 20 years uh, solar thermal sector. Um, she's the founder and managing director of the agency Sovico, and she's also the news editor of solarthermalworld.org, a very known website uh, covering topics from our sector. Um, she's also author and collaborator in many relevant publications, uh, for instance, the section on solidity and cooling uh, market and industry, in the REN21 Global Status Report, uh, which is a reference report for renewables worldwide. Um, Berbel and Solhiko have been dedicating attention to solar heat for industrial processes over the last years, publishing some relevant reports, also in the framework of the international project Solar Payback. So Berbel will present recent developments related to different applications in our industry and also in terms of policy. So Berbel, please go ahead. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, thank you also to the organizers for this uh, speaking slot. My name, uh, my name is Bärbel Epp and my topic is Industry and Market Trends 2017. Well, um, so RICO is a global uh, market research network focusing on solar thermal sector. I think Pietro already explained some of what we are doing. One is uh, that we contribute uh, the solar heating and cooling chapter to this report, Global Status Report. It's um, actually the report where also the, the nice figures of the solar heat worldwide study always are replicated. So you see that the solar heat worldwide study is the real reference for good figures in our sector. It's a policy document, 325 pages this year, including 80 pages endnotes. So it's a very condensed uh, product. It is downloaded over the year 70,000 times and it's launched all around the world in several events. And uh, the press releases are published in 12 languages. So it's covered by a lot of press media around the world. And uh, the key message this year, the headline, so to say, of the press release was a transformation is picking up speed in the power sector, but urgent action is required in heating, cooling and transport. 
So the, aut the authors of the REN21 uh, network really stress the fact that there is much more attention worldwide in the power sector than uh, these other sectors need a lot more attention. I found this very positive and I think it's also the style a bit of REN21 to really uh, try to get heating and cooling and transport more in the ag agenda. This is the content page of the GSR. I have to admit that it's very electricity focused, even if the authors try to stress solar heating and cooling. But I would like to recommend three parts, as I assume that you are all rather heating oriented. There is a, a heating and cooling chapter in the global overview in the first chapter. There is um, the policy landscape a chapter is very much recommended because it has a lot of uh, different policies and a lot of these policies indirectly or directly affect solar heating and cooling because it's concerning efficiency, it's concerning city integration policies, um, it's uh, concerning sector coupling. So I think this, this uh, chapter is for sure worth reading. And in the third chapter, you find uh, the solar heating and cooling section itself, which is a condensed um, industry and market oriented chapter. And for this chapter, we have done, uh, we have updated our annual ranking of the largest flat plate collector manufacturers, which are I would like to share with you here. This usually shows uh, very well the trends which are going on in the sector and some of them Werner Weiss already stressed in his presentation. For example, it's the dominance of China within this ranking. For the first time, so this ranking is based on the collector area produced 2017 by these companies and um, it's only flat plate collectors and it's dominated by Chinese companies for the first time. In recent years, usually Bosch and sometimes Brazilian companies were among the top three. And this year for the first time, it's all Chinese companies. And this comes because um, we have now six million square meters of flat plate collectors sold and produced in China in 2017, which is three times the size of Europe. So a huge market size and it's increasing, as Lana said. There is this uh, area marking a new cooperation between Green One Tech and Hire, which might be worth noting. Hire is a huge appliance uh, manufacturer from China and they purchased 51% of the largest flat plate collector manufacturer, Green One Tech, from Austria. And the aim of this uh, sort of purchase or joint venture is um, to produce large scale flat plate collectors for the Chinese market. This means modules above 12 square meters. There is something else striking in this ranking of this year that the Turkish, Greece and uh, Spanish uh, manufacturers did extremely well. The last ones profited from export and export always means that there are new emerging markets around the world which we don't really so much um, address or reach with our market statistics because they are still uh, young and emerging. But um, for just to quote Greece here, the Greek manufacturers were able to increase their export by 41% in 2017, up to 325 megawatt, and their local market is 221 megawatt. So they are now much more exporting, and the countries they mention, or the regions, is mainly Eastern Africa, there's some North African Gulf region, and also Latin America. So that is a good news that even um, Italy, the term siphon market did well. So these manufacturers, they particularly ship um, thermosiphon technology and um, that's good news for us that new emerging markets are really coming up. The bad news is mentioned here with the red arrows. These are the German, particular German manufacturers and they all suffer a lot from the declining European markets and uh, declined in average by 10% in 2017. Um, this is a bit less than the market, but it uh, shows that uh, they really facing uh, trouble. This last uh, company, MV, is worth mentioning because it's from India. Um, over several years in the ranking, there were no Indian companies because the India was completely shifting to vacuum tubes. And it's uh, this year, the 2017 ranking, for the first time that an Indian company showed up here again on the last place. And this comes because in India there is a big sort of uh, quarrel going on between um, flat plate and vacuum tubes because um, flat plates have a nice standard 
and vacuum tubes don't have a standard yet and some and uh, that some states reacted in the way that tenders are linked to a collector with a standard because they are more quality oriented and they had a lot of trouble with chinese imports and so um, slowly vacuum to um, flat plates are sort of recovering in india a bit this is uh, the 20 largest countries only looking at the new additions 2017 and uh, some of the countries that Werner already mentioned show up here as well. The bold blue one, uh, the bold ones, you know, the percentage figures which are bold are positive. So at least we have a few countries which are really doing well. I think Turkey, India was already mentioned. There's also Israel, Mexico, Greece and South Africa. But we also see that a lot of countries uh, suffered again and declined because of this uh, de declination of the residential sector. And Germany did extremely bad with um, minus 16 percent and France, with, uh, the, which is the last one on this slide, with 27 percent minus is hardly existing anymore. China, you see that it's out of record because it's sort of too big to be addressed directly in a chart together with other countries. It's, I think, 20 times bigger than Turkey. And it's still at minus six, but I think with a great transition that Werner already mentioned, and uh, we will still hear a lot uh, from this uh, huge market, is especially because they have very um, challenging targets in the commercial segment, that means space heating, ship, like solar process heat, and solar cooling. And um, this is, uh, you know, this uh, very dynamic development of the commercial segment in China led to a lot of strategic industry corporations. Um, over the last two years. One I mentioned already, this is this Hire Green One Tech Corporation, which is uh, mentioned on this photo. It's the boss of Hire, to, uh, the boss of Green One Tech together with the responsibles of Hire. This is another very important uh, cooperation formed in 2016 between Arkon Sunmark, which is a system supplier from Denmark, installing the huge um, district heating plants, you know, in uh, Denmark, and Sunrain on the other side, which is the largest collector manufacturer in China. And um, they, they, their aim is to develop large-scale solar systems in China, and they have contracted the first system, which is a 22,000 square meter system they want to install in Tibet, which is a state financed, so it's subsidized, but it's a big installation, including uh, a pit uh, a storage, um, seasonal storage, and the whole piping system is also new. This, this is again a Chinese-European joint venture. It's between Absolicon in China, uh, in uh, Sweden, and a joint venture which was formed in China. The idea of this joint venture is to build up a parabolic draft collector unit, also something which Werner already stressed that more and more concentrating collectors are used for heat applications. And Absolicon is selling complete production lines and found these partners and the system is now so that means the installation unit is now uh, the production unit sorry is now established in China and um, Absolicon will cooperate with the companies also to implement uh, commercial solar thermal uh, systems in China. This is a bit uh, in another range this last photo but it also shows that uh, a lot of players are looking very dynamically at uh, the commercial solar thermal system market and um, this photo shows a company from Uzbekistan, it's called Artel Group, and with the help of a Turkish company, which is called Solimpex, and which was part of my ranking, which I showed recently, um, they built up a very modern laser welding oriented brand new collector production unit in Uzbekistan. So from this story as well, Uzbekistan is one of the countries that have a solar obligation already established, which is gradually should um, make new buildings have obligatory um, a solar system. So they look at this uh, larger building units and um, it looks that um, there is a lot of dynamic at going on. For years, we didn't have much new capacity built up, but now we see that there's really investments again going on in our industry. This is linked to it, record year of new ship installations. This is the figures, you know, we had 110 ship systems in 2017, Im implemented in 19 countries from 35 different ship suppliers. 
and we are now it at estimated at least 635 ship systems at the end of 2017. This figure arrived from this supplier map um, within the project Solar Payback, which is a ship promotion program um, in four countries. It's uh, Mexico, Brazil, South Africa and India. Um, we looked at the supply chain, you know, we wanted to give a forum to the ship suppliers, you know, the technology suppliers for this particular segment of solar industrial heat. And we identified 81 of them and they are presented in this map. It's an interactive map. So if you click on one of these markers, you receive the following information about the country, of the, about the company. You will see how many reference systems they installed in ship until the end of 2017, how much collector area this was, um, which co collector type if they do one, which one they produce, and we link to um, the references they have integrated to the world, uh, to the website that Werner Weiss presented in his presentation, which is called ship-plants.info, and which gathers on a technical basis um, ship plans, um, so we link the reference of Hemin in this case to their references in this other plan. So we try to link the both websites and um, it's really obvious that this large committed supply chain is a strong driver of the ship market. So um, this is, I think, a new phenomenon in our sector that we have at one point, you know, we have huge potential in ship, which uh, is still sort of more or less sleeping, but we have a very uh, large and committed supply chain technology suppliers who really address this field. We asked them in this survey I'm talking about for drivers and barriers in this market. There is economic competitiveness in India and Mexico, and these were the markets also that have the most uh, ship plants. We have countries with direct subsidies like India, France and Germany. And we have this big driver which will come up probably more and more, especially in China, and this is cleaner air. So it's not cleaner air, but cleaner air. This is a spelling mistake. And it's this replacing of coal boilers in industry, which is striking in China and really troubles the industry and making them um, look into alternatives. And solar thermal steam is an alternative. But on the other side, barriers are huge and barriers need to be tackled. And one is that there is still low awareness of ship among industry. There's little existence, if you imagine that we have probably hundreds of thousands of production companies and we have only 600 demonstration plants, so little visibility of existing ship plants. We have still low fossil fuel prices and therefore we have difficulties to address the short payback times with the industrial customers ask for. So um, this last statement here, every project is the customer education process and requires project specific engineering, sort of uh, gathers a bit the situation we have. There is big potential, obviously, but there's still a lot, uh, we are still far away from standardization and we are still uh, far away from having uh, clients which are really aware and running uh, towards our doors and uh, asking for ship. <laughs> Um, well, yes, we have concentrating, increasing concentrating technologies and I just uh, share with you this uh, slide which maybe gathers a bit the concentrating markets of 2017. We have counted 143 megawatt uh, of these concentrating heat technologies and they were is contributed from the different countries and again it's uh, more or less the same countries which always show up, Oman with this ma major installation class point which Werner presented. We have one player in China, Vicot, who is very strong in parabolics. Actually you see from this uh, list that um, in Mexico it's the same situation, it's usually a handful of these um, uh, concentrating technology suppliers that make the world market because it's still small but it's growing. We have in Italy, um, because of the nice incentive situation with a feed-in tariff as well as a, um, a subsidy for collector areas, two larger R&D projects with Fresnel and Parabolics and they are linked to an OSC cycle. India is the only country where we really have a lot of different suppliers that are using concentrating collectors and this comes because they have a particular, it's the only country worldwide with a subsidy scheme for con 
concentrating collector technologies for heat production. So it's the only country worldwide. It's in place since 2010. It was a bit delaying 2017, but it's now confirmed until 2020 and will for sure have more effect on the market. In Mexico, again, only one uh, in the slide, uh, Prito Citrus is a client sort of of inventive power and they do ship on uh, for uh, with concentrating collectors. Yes, this is a, a short uh, remark uh, on, on the district heating market, which was very well presented by Werner, but there's one additional information I would like to share with you. And this is that increasing new policies are in place for solar district heating, especially in Europe. And I think that this, uh, this uh, wording that solar district heating is the most cost effective way to decarbonize the building sector absolutely is understood by policy makers in the meantime. So that was really penetrated by a lot of international studies in the last years and it's, it arrived sort of and it's, in, it's sort of built up in clear policies. And this, this whole list here, it shows six countries with dedicated subsidy schemes for large scale solar thermal and I don't want to go into detail here. I just want to tell you that this is really a, a nice trend. It shows Austria, France, Italy, Netherlands, Germany, and Slovenia. You find all these programs, they are all explained in the solarthermalworld.org incentive database. So the, the links at the back at the end of these uh, uh, country uh, portraits are linked to the website. And uh, so we will update this incentive database uh, on Solar Thermal World regularly. And you can make sure that uh, the next countries to look into are Poland and the Balkan countries, because we have clear information that also in these countries, district heating will be subsidized. So good news from this area. And my last action, my last part is concerning solar air conditioning. It's actually still a niche market, no doubts about that. We did a survey among uh, technology suppliers and we found that several companies left this market. So this is due to uh, the PV dominance, that PV electricity with a co compression chiller can do the same job. But we also found some committed uh, suppliers that are still um, doing well and um, we have gathered their information. One of them is Solid from Austria, which uh, uh, implemented two really nice installations on solar cooling in 2017. The one from Nicaragua is on the top, the one from IKEA in Singapore is on the bottom. There's one larger installation in India with 1,575 vacuum tube collectors. It's a public uh, building which is supplied. And there is a new uh, system from Industrial Solar for, with Fresnel collectors and um, they doing both process heat and air conditioning. So all in all, there are, if you are a committed solar thermal air conditioning supplier, you still find stimulating factors. And I want to end with these stimulating factors in solar heating and cooling. And one of them is, it's a very striking trend that solar thermal cooling makes absolute sense always when both hot water heating and cooling demand is covered over the year. So this is the clear message from, for example, Yasaki in Italy. They commissioned nine solar cooling systems in commercial buildings in Italy and Spain doing exactly that. That means over the big time of the year they do uh, solar hot water, but in the very hot season they do cooling as well. Then there is a clear trend that the MENA region and the Gulf regions are increasingly asking for solar, also solar thermal cooling um, applications. And this comes because they have an electricity issue. In some of these countries like Kuwait and others, um, the subsidies on electricity will be removed. So the electricity prices will increase uh, significantly and people spend a lot of uh, electricity for cooling their houses. So um, there was uh, two, for example, two installations in 2017, which are mentioned here from Fahrenheit and TVP Solar installed in this region in Kuwait and in Dubai. So there's probably more to come. And the last one is again China, which uh, with their ambitious targets, which are all mentioned in this 13th five-year plan, in solar cooling it sounds like 2% of the solar cooling load of the cooling load of buildings should be covered by solar thermal in 2020. And two rather big installations were announced there. It's a 40,000 square meter flat plate collector. 
system which should uh, cool 200,000 floor space uh, public buildings and another private one, 10,000 square meter collector field, um, it's a, an office building in Xinan. So probably China will also have some new news on solar cooling next year. That's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Berbo. And yes, we've been having uh, many questions on both presentations already. Um, so as I mentioned, we have the luck of having uh, an outstanding group of speakers today. Um, our next speaker, Jean-Christophe Adorn, is a long-time expert in our sector. So Jean-Christophe is the manager of the Swiss firm Base Consultants and has been involved in solar thermal since 1979 and with solar PV since 2005. So Jean-Christophe combines perfectly his experience as operating agent of the IA solidity and cooling uh, task application of PVT collectors aiming to enhance the awareness about PVT and to consolidate the knowledge on the PVT systems for the solar and HVAC industry. He will give us more details about the potential PVT and the work of task, this task 60 in his presentation. Jean-Christophe, um, please go ahead. Thank you, Pedro. So, uh, good evening or good day to everyone. I see that we are like 200, more than 200 online, so I'm very happy to speak uh, here from Switzerland. As you can see, I'm going to talk a little bit more technically uh, about PVT systems and a few trends on the PVT market. It's uh, about a task you can see and read here, uh, IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Task 60. A task is a project and it will last three years starting from this year. I'll give you some more uh, about the task and of course you can go to the website. We will give you the websites afterwards. What is a PVT collector? Most of you uh, probably know. Uh, it's a mixture of PV, something producing electricity and, and thermal. It could be, it can be liquid uh, uh, driven, it can be air collectors, it could be a mixture and uh, combination, hybridization of uh, two things, and it can be unglazed in all three cases without cover, or it can be glazed but you know the new uh, term for that is whisk window integrated uh, uh, solar collector whisk collectors but recently we have seen and you'll, i'll show examples concentrators coming cpvt and also vacuum tubes or vacuum collectors with pv and t and the construction is always almost the same for for the time being you have at the bottom the t part and at the top you have the PV part which are combined either glued welded or any kind of arrangement that is the um, the, the, the most important thing the manufacturers have to to take into account how they will hybridize the collectors you'll see some examples they were they are already with us they look different they behave different they oh, well, uh, I got a problem with me. What, what's what, what's what is the market? What is this? I'm sorry, I have a problem with the. Yeah, that's it. Sorry, there was an interference. So I show you three. No, let's go back to this one. I I show the three types of collectors on the market. A a one on the top, which is insulated at the back. Yes. We cannot see your screen. Oh really? Uh, let's say. Why is that? Okay. Okay, I, I, try, I try to... Can you see the screen now? We can see the screen if you can maximize. I'm sorry for that. Now? Yes. Oh, sorry. So you missed... Did you miss the, the previous ones? No, it was when uh, you had interference, you were at the, in, in this slide. So Okay, can... so, sorry, sorry to everyone for that. So you have on the right hand side, the bottom uh, unglazed collector and on the left hand side, you can see a concentrator. It's a factor of two with a line of, uh, of PV cells put into the uh, on top of the absorbers. This is new products coming on the market from those companies I mentioned here. Um, a very uh, uh, interesting one for those who are interested into concentration is this one from a, 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 uh, this company. And you can see that they try to concentrate as much as possible, maybe factor 10 or factor 12 
on these uh, PV cells, which have, as you, you can imagine, very high efficiency. So you save lots of cost on the PV part uh, and to get the most out of it in terms of electricity, but you still produce heat uh, uh, through the, the heat pipe or the pipe which is inside this collector. You can uh, download much of information about these uh, collector, uh, concentrator collector that you can see here. They are trackers also um, on the, the website of this company uh, I'll mention in the end. What, why do we go PVT? It's, not, it's an old story. It started in the 90s, probably uh, you know and you recall this, but it was like a, there was like a gap in between the products and, and the market. Now what we can see is that the products, new products are, are, come, are coming and it's of course because PV is going so low in price that the combination makes it very interesting and more and more. But the main uh, strength uh, is that it can produce three things, as you can imagine, heat up to 170 degrees Celsius, as I showed on the concentrator. It can produce cooling energy uh, through, through uh, what you, we saw during variable um, talk uh, through uh, ORC systems, or it can produce electricity, and then you can use this electricity, of course, for all kind of usage, and, and especially for your uh, or the client's cars. As you know, uh, probably the electricity driven cars are going to dominate the market in the near future. Okay, so, um, so I still have this interference. Sorry for that. I don't understand really why, but we'll see. Yeah, okay. Uh, can you see uh, it, Pedro? I'm just checking if everyone can see this slide. No, we lost the screen again. Oh, why is that so? Now? Yes, and now it's maximized, so yes, it's okay, thanks. Okay, very sorry. Uh, PVT is more complex than PV and separate thermal, but of course there is a, 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 a gain that is more, that is that it is more efficient. If you just compare on, the, on this slide, uh, the, the roof of 42 square meters uh, available and you put on red and blue, uh, solar thermal separately from PV modules and in green here oh, PVT collector, good PVT collectors that we might have on, we have on the market, you can see that you can save like 23% of energy or you can produce 23% more solar energy out of this on the right hand side uh, configuration than on the left hand side. So the, the challenge is to really uh, do it uh, with the new products and the new systems I'm going to show in a moment, but you can see that if you combine, the aesthetics might be a little bit better on this uh, part of, uh, on, on this solution, and also the efficiency, as we said. And then the cost, of course, it will be about the cost. If the combined cost stays uh, uh, lower than 23% compared to the, to the separated uh, solutions, then you're better off with PVT solution. And this is what we are going to target in within the task 60. We're going to understand in which conditions and for which segments of market this is true or interesting. Of one family house, probably uh, there is something interested, interesting to see. Multi-family houses up to 100 kilowatts, uh, commercial industrial processes. We have some examples around the world that are uh, moving to PVT to do the uh, process heat with electricity uh, production. And of course, uh, that was not obvious, but we have been uh, told that big systems also for heating and cooling, uh, district heating systems uh, are up to one megawatt can um, also be looked uh, at from the PVT uh, side of, uh, of the collector. Uh, the market probably is where PV is, and you've seen in the previous presentations that PV is taking over a lot and, and, and thermal is a bit, uh, 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 lagging behind, so it might help uh, solar thermal to work with PV. Uh, you also have noticed that in some countries, heat pumping, heat pumps solutions or cooling machine are um, uh, really increasing their market share over other system of uh, energy production, uh, fossil fuels uh, mainly. So where heat pump or cooling machines are, are then we have an advantage with PVT solution because we produce electricity and the heat pump can be uh, connected to the T part. 
where electricity, heat and coal, the three supplying uh, fluids that or energies that we can do with PVTs are needed, then PVT will have a, a clear advantage. And of course, also for process energy, because you've seen, and it's quite new for some of, 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 of you probably, that we can go up to 180 degrees Celsius with concentrating collectors producing electricity too. This is a, a standard uh, new examples of what's going on uh, with PVT. It's in Switzerland, uh, could be anywhere in, in Europe. You see those kind of buildings, there's five uh, buildings equipped with uncovered uh, PVT collectors on, on top. And it's uh, providing heat to very low temperature heating system because it's uh, um, net zero energy buildings. And there's also a cooling network, which is coupled to a few 215 boreholes and of course there is a heat pump and these 3487 square meters of uncovered pvt collectors are producing the electricity for the heat pump and the the uh, regenerating the boreholes in the winter time uh, um, in this in the summertime uh, to be used for the winter season um, coupled to the heat, uh, to the heat pumps a bit of the market uh, we need for uh, most stats pvt is just taking a little share of something in the world so the stats are not uh, available yet and they are very inaccurate so what we we did the swiss uh, spf institute and also tno in netherlands did a survey of what was on the market last year and they found roughly the same things um there are about uh, more than 50 products you can't imagine that more than 50 pvt collectors on the market mostly for liquid uh, cooled uh, solution and uh, uncovered as you can see the blue uh, share of the of the market how they sell is something else how big is the is the real market in terms of square meters is really something that we need to to address but for the time being it's it's um getting uh, uh, some market share in, in the PVT uh, seg segments, but we don't really know at what pace. I can give you some hints for Switzerland. We have like 300 PVT installation for 15,000 square meters total, which is half a percent of the PV plus T market. It's very difficult to, to compare to something. Should we compare to PV only, to T only, or to the sum of it? I started by saying uh, half a percent of the sum of the uh, installed square meters in Switzerland, but it's up to the IEA groups to decide what kind of statistics we're going to use. It's still a growing market, as you can imagine. In a PVT system, I'm going to uh, sketch what is a PVT system that's uh, not only now the collectors, I was talking about the collectors uh, until now, PVT collectors, you can see on the uh, left hand side in green here going to the load where you can have heat domestic hot water or cooling load it could be local in the building or it could be through a network as you can imagine so then from from the pvt collectors to the load there is a system we have to, to put in place and this system will obviously deliver heat on the top and then also electricity it's the uh, characteristic of the collectors and electricity you can use it to any um, kind of power um, machines or whatever. You can also store that into batteries or something else. And there is a real influence of the grid tariffs you can have in your region uh, uh, about what you should do with this electricity. Should you store it? Should you use it? Should you put that on the network? It's up to the uh, local conditions to say. And now on the heat side, um, you could produce also the heat with the heat pump that could be driven from the electricity from the PVT. This heat pump could take the energy from, from the ambient or from the ground or from an ice storage that could, that could be uh, used also for cooling purposes like ground and ice storage, as you know. And of course, the heat can be stored like we all know in, in tanks and you can use this um, uh, storage to to uh, supply heat or domestic water directly from from the, the the storage or you can go through the heat pump here to get your heat or domestic water so you see it's quite a complex system 
and there's a lot to optimize and find out which is the best combination. Should you store here the heat? Should you not store? Should you use batteries? Should you go more through electricity and heat pump, et cetera, et cetera. This is the purpose of the group. We are um, now setting up since a few months, international group working on that. And uh, I hope you get uh, all the answers uh, about what is important on which market segments in the near future. Uh, you can also imagine there's a lot of innovations that are going to come uh, on PVT uh, collectors like the fluid, nanofluids or dark fluids, magnetic fluids, I can, uh, you name it. Uh, the cover also, the way you seal the systems, how you, you, you pile up the layers. Of course, PV cells are going to uh, uh, evolve in many directions also. Organic cells, we're talking lots of organic cells nowadays. And the temperature dependency um, of, the, of the PV cells is also very important, of course, because if you go higher in temperature to produce the heat, then you might decrease the uh, yield of electricity if this key, uh, K coefficient is positive. But it's not only innovation about the, 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 the components, which is more on the manufacturer uh, side of the problem, but it's also at the system level. I was just referring to that previously. And this is the, the goal of what a solar heating and cooling IEA task is doing, working at the system level, how to integrate in um, different, uh, different uh, boundary conditions, the whole the components. How the task is organized, am I coming to the conclusion now? I don't want to go too much into details because everything is on the website and some uh, of your uh, colleagues are uh, maybe participating in our task. We have uh, sketched the task into uh, four different what we call subtasks. One is PVT systems in operation. All the systems you can find around the world should be described here uh, on, on a data sheet and have, we could have some monitoring in situ that we will be using for modeling afterwards. Subtask B is about the uh, characterization of the performances of PVT. We don't really know now, because it's different in every country, how you should characterize PVT collectors. What is the um, electric efficiency? What is the thermal efficiency? And what is it when it is combined? How you would uh, sketch a, a characteristic line of the combination? This is the work that we have to do together and also to make all the possible possible definitions of what is the energy yield because you can't really add heat and electricity as you know so there will be some discussions about experts here how to do it properly um, and the uh, subtask c here you can see is about modeling we aim at using this uh, definition of collectors and the way they are measured using collector models put into the system description here, we aim at uh, uh, being able to simulate what we have seen in operation, in systems in operation, and to optimize them with methods that most of you know, what if analysis and sensitivity analysis and so forth. And we have a D uh, subtask, which is about doing the key performance indicators, not only the, the, the uh, uh, energy, uh, um, indicators but also maybe economics life cycle and so forth and to also disseminate what, what we are doing in different conferences and to to the market i have the pleasure to have very good uh, subtask leaders uh, thomas ramschak from austria uh, Kobinian kramer from germany asia sons from spain and andreas eberle from uh, switzerland this is the leading team of this uh, uh, task 60 that i am the operating agent of we have been uh, having a first meeting a few uh, weeks ago, and we had, we were almost 50 participants from those list, uh, this list of countries, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Spain, France, Italy, UK, Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, just to show you who is really interested into working to PVT within the IEA SHC countries, which is not all the world. It's about 50, 25 countries that are a member of this um, uh, circle, but we have also other countries outside the solar heating and cooling uh, per se um, authorized countries that would like to work with us and we will see how um, we can manage that. If you want to participate, you have to go to our website and ask your, your national contact person, uh, which is uh, uh, shown on the uh, IESHC website. You can also go to our website. It's it's about the same uh, URL link, but just put task 60 before and you 
you will discover lots of information about what we are going to do and namely this little poster says it all what i said just today and in the end i'd like you to to um, uh, come uh, often as often as as needed for you to this website which is which is really the solar heating and cooling focal point of uh, information that we would like to have in the in 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 this uh, circle of experts and you can find what i said about task 60 but also about many other tasks we are running like 10 different tasks dealing with light uh, building uh, heating cooling and, and everything which is about solar heating and cooling uh, as uh, scientifically and uh, as um, uh, uh, interest as more inter most interesting as possible for the whole uh, community in the world thank you for attending this webinar and i give it over to my uh, organizer and uh, Pedro it's up to you now thank you thank you very much uh, Jean-Christophe so we will now proceed uh, to your questions we've been receiving uh, many so far so we uh, I'm not sure we'll be able to tackle them or I'm almost I'm almost sure we'll not be able to tackle them all um, so um, we'll start with uh, grouping some questions also to uh, make it quicker in terms of the reaction so the first uh, three questions go to Werner Weiss uh, and are related to the uh, question between ETCs and uh, evacuated tube collectors and flat plate collectors in China so we have questions from Stefano Lambertucci, Eduardo Zarzamoya and Eduardo Uranga um, so what are the main reasons uh, behind the shift from evacuated tube to flat plate in China. Um, so um, why is the commercial deployment in China nowadays dominated by flat plate collectors? Um, and what are the specific benefits of flat plate collectors over evacuated uh, tubes? So Werner, if you can enlighten us, please. Yeah, I can try to do it. Uh, so there's there's still, I want to mention before, uh, I answered the question, there's still, of course, a big dominance of evacuated, evacuated tube collectors in China. But step by step, it shifts to flat plate, and flat plates are used more and more. My uh, assumption is, uh, starting with the benefits of flat plate collectors, which might be part of the explanation, uh, flat plate collectors you can use as uh, instead of roof tiles. So you, the collector is the roof. You can cover the roof with the, with the flat plate collectors. You don't need roof tiles. And from the, so that means uh, if you use evacuated tubes on a roof, you need roof tiles or a normal ordinary roof below it. So that might be one of the benefits of flat plates. The other is if you go to really large scale systems, from the hydraulic point of view, it's easier to connect flat plate collectors uh, compared to evacuated tube collectors if you go really on large scale systems. This might be two of the reasons uh, why there is a shift towards flat plate collectors uh, in China. But there are no clear studies on it, so that's my point of view on this. Maybe Pebble could add to this question as uh, answer or answer as well. Well, just briefly, no, it was, I think, very well said. It's only the facade installations which also um, look rather into flat plate. And as they have not a lot of roof space in China and huge buildings, in the balcony installations, they prefer flat plates because of security. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these. Um, real estate projects which are built in large size in the urban areas are flat plates. This is also the third reason. Yeah, it's, it's significantly easier for building integration. And you look on, if you go on large cities or cities in, in general, and to de decarbonize cities, then we have to use the available roofs and facades to use it as a energy converter, either with flat plate collectors, which is easy to integrate, or of course also with PV, and they're easier to integrate architecturally. Oh, 
Okay, uh, thank you very much. The the next couple of questions are related to um, the the sort heat for industrial processes. So the first question is which solutions are needed from policymakers in with regard to barriers for solar heat uh, uh, for industrial processes, um, and um, which barriers should uh, be overcome to increase installed capacity of solar concentrating thermal systems. So the questions come from Fernando Manuel Gomez Castro and Stefano Lambertucci. And if I to start, I th I'm not so sure if policy is, uh, there's more a general answer to policy. If they go, uh, if they just fulfill what they promised or signed already, if you think on COP21 agreement, to decarbonize our economy within the next 20 years, and this is what is needed, what all our politicians signed, then it's already, and they have clear measures in, in this uh, regard. But the main obstacle, I think, is still that the lack of companies who, need, who have an understanding of the industrial process, and at the same time, they have an understanding of solar thermal and sector coupling. I think the times are over where uh, solar thermal companies sell ship systems. If they don't have an understanding of the industrial process, they will fail because they mainly concentrate on the solar thermal part. And there's a huge market in my point of view, if you have both, if you combine the knowledge of uh, system integration, so understanding of the process, what is needed, and the understanding what solar thermal can contribute. And even more in future, the, the sector coupling of heating, cooling, and electricity to combine it. And for these companies, I see a big, uh, bright future. And so the main obstacle I see here in the industry, not so much in, in, the, in the field of, of policy, of course, the general framework condition have to be changed. It makes no sense at all if they sign a new contract for a new gas pipeline for Europe, uh, if they, on the other hand, signed COP21. So it's comp completely counterproductive. But yeah, I mentioned where I see the, the main obstacle at the moment. Well, this was a really meta level. Maybe I uh, crap into that. I think that a ship needs uh, support and there are two tracks. You know, there is the inner sector track. That means what can the sector, that means the technology suppliers can do themselves. And I think this is really awareness, you know, if you go to industry associations and they are the best vehicle to address the message that industry has a big heat demand and you have options to tackle this in a CO2 neutral way, you will see that you have a lot of surprised faces in front of you because dairies and breweries and food processing and metal processing companies in the world are not aware. So go, the industry itself must go along associations and do their own awareness raising. But the policy must stress or, or have uh, frame conditions which makes it easier for the companies to invest or stimulate. You know, like India, for example, they have such a big uh, oil oil consumption in the industry that they are talking about stimulate. That means um, a quote of for renewables in the industry. They will would like to. Um, it's the same like China. China has already a sort of. Um, a uh, sort of obligation because they just tell the, the companies you have a limited access to steam produced from coal. So if you want to reach your production targets, you have to invest into solar uh, or renewable heat and steam. So I think there needs to be frame conditions which make the urgentness more striking that heat and industry is a huge emission uh, polluter and um, that that's the two tracks own um, uh, address the associations but also policy must show the way that's my opinion on ship <laughs> yeah you're right Bebel, i just want to add so of course on the country level like in austria we have a support program for ship systems for several years in place from the climate and energy fund where this climate and energy fund uh, subsidizes or funds ship systems is up to 40 percent of the total cost and of course this is one of the reasons why the country 
is in, in the leading under the amongst the leading countries. This is quite important to have the demonstration system to show that these systems are working. This is a, a main push in this direction and encourage these companies to go in this direction. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next questions go to um, Jean Christophe Adorn. So, um, how is the current uh, potential penetration of PVT systems in solar air conditioning applications from Fernando Manuel Gomez Castro? Um, the, the other question is that combined systems uh, are very logical. Uh, why is it too late to go to market? Why is it not developed so far from uh, Batu Verdic? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much for those two questions. I take the last uh, question first, and then I'll move to the to the solar air conditioners. Uh, well, um, why is so late? Uh, mainly because of the cost of the PV. Uh, uh, five years ago, it dropped like, as you know, dramatically from uh, like three dollars per watt to 30 cents. It's a factor 10. So what it's called in, in what we call in business, factor 10 over less than 10 years, we call it a disruption. So they're really a disruptive uh, effect now on the PV side. So PV will come so cheap, there will be like a little simple commodity that you, you can put on everything, on cars, on, on, on facades, on on uh, balconies and, and on roofs and the, the the thermal guys said why don't we go with the pv and uh, because have you as you have seen most of the time we have the three uh, uh, loads uh, close or all together uh, heating and, and electricity or cooling and electricity so the main reason is this and uh, also the technology of combining uh, pv and t has evolved to uh, new directions because of innovation compared to what happened uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, or we, they were just, the producers were just taking uh, existing collectors, flat plate collectors, and putting some PV glued on top of it. So it was expensive, not reliable, not that good uh, to operate and so forth. Now they, we have designed product, hybrid design product, and low cost PV makes the trick. And the first question was about, uh, um, can we see a bright future for PVT in solar air conditioning? Of course, we, we see that PV and, and, and T could do the, the, the two things. Um, it's difficult to say that the uh, desiccant cooling, for example, will have a good chance in the future. We have seen that over the 20 past years, that it is a, still a niche market because compressors are produced uh, by by tens of millions, and they are very very cheap, and it's easier to operate a compressing compressor system with a with a PV um, uh, module with PV production on on the top than anything else. So PVT might take a share of something. If probably you need some some warm air at some point in the building, you could probably combine um, efficiently and and cleverly. But I, I don't see it as a huge market for, for PVT, this application. But we'll see. It's, it's starting over, as I said, and uh, it's, it's growing in many directions. Uh, we'll see after, after probably three years of the task in which direction PVT market is going to be uh, more uh, proeminent. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next questions have to do uh, more with the, um, uh, the general status of the of the market. So they are addressed to, to Werner and to Berbel. So uh, first question is, um, which factors cause the overall trend for decline in the installation of new solar thermal systems from Fernando Manuel Gomez Castro? Um, for Berbel, why does the German, why do the German enterprises have problems in manufacturing? and exporting of flat plate collectors uh, from the same person. Uh, and another question um, for Werner and, Ber uh, and, and Berbel. Do you see a possible recovery in the future for the domestic sector uh, from Stefano Lambertucci? So, Berbel, do you want to start? 
Did I get the first question right? It was concerning thermosiphon. Can you repeat the first question? No, the first question were on the factor, which factors cause the overall trend for decline in the installation of the new solar thermal system of new solar thermal systems. Oh, in general, in, okay. The overall market, yeah, global market. Okay. Well, yes, just uh, briefly to the first and the second question, maybe. Um, I mean, it was said before, it's really the residential sector. This was the core segment in many countries, as Werner said, and um, the, the, uh, re well, the, the recovery of the uh, um, heat pumps, which are very much promoted, and they are, not, they are promoted indirectly by policy, but they are also directly promoted by the new label in Europe, so they reach A++ a plus plus already, and so you don't need, you have a very nice, efficient heating system in the cellar, which the installer even prefers before of course he doesn't have to go to the roof. So we have a supply chain, we have sort of a supply chain problem on the residential side, we have an image problem, we have a cost problem. And this is really, really getting hard to crack. And it's this is in place since five, six years in Europe concerning the residential markets and the commercial markets do not offset in the right space. The other question is a bit tricky, why German manufacturers are not so strong in exporting. If you look at back to my uh, you know, ranking, you see that these are the big heating industry. And I think the big heating industry, they did well at the beginning of the crisis because they had a certain stock, sort of a certain sales chain and a certain installer chain still. So they did rather well. But in the recent years, the last two years, they dropped absolutely with the market. So. And I think the, the, the commitment in these huge companies is declining. So they, they reduce stuff and they reduce positions and they reduce, uh, you know, uh, marketing budgets and all that. So I think that, that has a double effect. And this is why um, they have very, really sort of a hard time in, in being present on a lot of markets. It's image within their companies. And um, this is what I see, at least if I look at their figures. And um, this this what explains why they're not so strong in export. So Werner. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But you said it already. Uh, the factors for the decline is exactly what you said. It's 90% uh, of the worldwide market is the residential market, and they are really under pressure with PV and uh, heat pumps. And I would say there is a possibility for recovering of the solar thermal sector if uh, the price of these small systems drop by something like 50%. And I know that a lot of companies don't like this, but I think either or further decline or re re significant reduction of the price of the small systems. Then I think there is a, a huge opportunity again because the main advantage of solar thermal compared to PV is that solar thermal needs about one third of the area in order to get the same amount of kilowatt hours compared to PV. So there's a huge advantage in terms of, of area needed, especially if you go to cities where area is really an issue. So every square meter should be used with the biggest uh, possible output. But it's a question of cost. Just to give you one indicator: the kilowatt hour. So on average, the kilowatt hour in the residential sector for single-family houses for hot water preparation, you're in the range of 12 to uh, 18 euro cent per kilowatt hour, without subsidy taking into account. If you go to the large-scale systems, where I see a growing market in solar district heating and chip systems then we reached already in the range of about three euro cent per kilowatt hour. And then you can see this big difference, why the large systems are growing without any subsidy. They, they are already uh, cost competitive compared to other heat sources. With three euro cent, you can do it easily, but uh, the residential sector is significantly higher with 12 to uh, 16, 18 euro cent per kilowatt hour. Thank you very much. Um, going back to uh, PVT, PVT systems uh, and, and Jean Christophe Adorn, um, I have a question from Mr. Drew Gillard. So, so thermal air conditioning is a way to link higher efficiency of thermal 
with 1.5 to 2 COP and uh, bit uh, photovoltaics. So that is a question. Um, and year round cooling and uh, heating uh, and hot water also. Um, and the other question is if PVT um, systems will be um, more feasible in co colder countries uh, like in Europe. And the question is from uh, Mr. Yadep Malavia. Thank you for those two questions. Well, the first one about the uh, what what PV can achieve in terms of uh, air conditioning, it's it's uh, it's already well known. There is an IEA task on this, and uh, you can go to our website and you get lots of information on, on this. Well, you can have compressors and. Uh, uh, PV is like 20% production and the compressor uh, system can go up to, let's say, factor two. So you make your calculation and you'll see that the, the uh, PV and compressor is, is about the same as uh, doing a solar thermal air system, but with less uh, complications. Um, but it depends much on the system and how you, you uh, organize your your uh, arrangement of components so it's i would uh, like the uh, the people uh, interested into that to look at the website of the um, solar cooling uh, task of the iea solar heating and cooling uh, and there are many also books that have been published by us the iea solar heating and cooling about on the topic why pvt would be, be best uh, uh, or better off in in europe than anywhere else Probably because we don't like PV to go at high temperature first, and then we need the heat to, to heat the buildings. So uh, PVT in deserts will face high temperatures, and, and probably the PV production will, will be reduced a little bit. Um, but uh, if you use the heat in maybe in the process, uh, for example, then you would say, I can also reduce the average uh, temperature of the PV modules during a day, but because I'm using the heat. So it gives an advantage of, of PVT against PV, even in very hot climate and, and, and hot uh, uh, sunny places. So it's not given that there will be PVT uh, so solutions for Europe only. I think we don't really know for the moment. It's probably depending on, on the quality of the products. I showed a few and there are many others and on their reliability and also on the the robustness of the companies behind you've seen this all reconfiguration of com companies from china to europe etc as uh, bearable explained and this can also happen in the pvt sector what is uh, interesting to notice is that we don't see for the moment the big players in pv and the big players in thermal coming to PVT. It's more something for startups at the moment. So it's it's a niche uh, restarting market and it's very difficult to say uh, the future on those basis. But I think I've sketched the advantages and I, I think PVT can, can gain some market share all over the world depending on the factors I, I mentioned. We will see. Thank you. Thank you very much Jean-Christophe. So one last question and then we'll have to close so this is for Werner and, and maybe Berbel can also help uh, and it's related to the market size and trends in Caribbean islands the Guadeloupe Martinique uh, also known as Don Tom from Mr. Marcelo Fratini uh, it's easy to answer I have we have no uh, market data on Martinique it's not uh, one of, of these 66 countries. We are trying every year to get new countries in, uh, but if all of you who are listening have good sources for, for data, uh, I would be more than happy to add more countries uh, to our statistics. So just send us an email and we get in contact with you if you have access to, to good data. So unfortunately, I have no market data on Martinique. Okay, thank you very much. Barbell, I assume you, you, you also don't have more information. 
No, I don't have as well. And I can only repeat, Werner, I'm really happy to publish anything I receive on solarthermalworld.org. And I'm pretty sure that I haven't done the story yet on Martinique. We have done Nicaragua and like the solar cooling system. And it's the same like Werner. We are very depending on receiving these news from around the world. And um, we process the data, the information on websites in our studies. Very welcome, everybody, to send us information. <laughs> That is um, a very good way to wrap up. So in, indeed, uh, um, there are still parts where it's difficult to get information on the market. Some information about developments or uh, new projects can be also interesting uh, news articles. So uh, everyone can play a role and, and be proactive and sharing some information um, that might be relevant also to, to other um, stakeholders in our sector. So um, finalizing, um, I want to I want to thank the the speakers for these uh, really enlightening presentations and and for um, the all the all the comments on the different questions, which were uh, some of them very challenging. And I also want to to thank the participants for for these questions. Um, from my side, I want to thank the IESO Academy, in particular the the IESO Inclusion Program, NISIS for this invitation and in particular for the work they have been doing in organizing these uh, webinars and I have to say I've been attending several of those and I'm looking forward for for the next one already. So this is from my side so um, I will uh, now um, pass uh, the baton for Joana for a final message and uh, depending where you are so good morning afternoon or, or evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pedro, and thank you to all our amazing panelist speakers that were on today's webinar, Verbal Ep, uh, Jean-Christophe Hador and Werner Weiss, and to you, Pedro, for the excellent job moderating the webinar. Uh, for all of you out there, if you want to contact the panelist speakers, please do so directly, uh, so not through, through ISIS. So you can see their presentations, they're all on the ISIS website. You can download them, have a look at them, and they have their contact details there. Uh, the next ISIS webinar is already in the planning and it is scheduled for July. It will be a webinar on the global status of renewables, so please stay tuned. We also have another Solar Academy webinar planned for this year, so all of you, please stay tuned to that. We will be sending you email invitations. Last but not least, thank you so much to everyone who um, you know, gave up their, their hour and a half today to listen to this webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot. I hope your questions were answered in the Q&A session. And um, I hope to see you back for, for the next webinar. Our recording will be available in a few hours on the ISIS website and the YouTube channel of the Solar Academy and the ISIS YouTube channel. Please send your feedback to public.relations.isis.org or complete the survey that pops up on your screen at the end of the webinar.